You've got a scene right there from one of the NASA cameras. There are many fixed television cameras around on the uh, rector uh, there by the uh, rocket right now, and that's from the very top level, up on that 320-foot uh, level. Not the very top, but almost the top. And what you see over there at the right is the command module itself. You see that pointed nose of the command module. It's got a little fairing on it, a protective cover, which is a boost cover, uh, so that in the first part of the flight, when the temperature gets up to around 1,250 degrees uh, and they're going through the atmosphere before they get out into space, uh, their windows won't fog up and they won't be subject to that temperature buffeting. Uh, and you see just the beginning of the launch escape tower there, that thing that looks like a kind of a television antenna uh, going up on the top. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. It's 54 minutes and counting toward the launch of Apollo 10 for man's second voyage to the moon, the dress rehearsal for the landing on the moon in July. The command module is manufactured by North American Rockwell at Downey, California. And there, as on all of our three previous manned Apollo flights, uh, we have our correspondent, Bill Stout, standing by in the command module mock-up with Leo Krupp, the test engineer for North American Rockwell, and they can tell us some of the highlights of this flight uh, from the command module standpoint. Gentlemen? Right, Walter, we're back at the home of the Apollo spacecraft, and Leo Krupp is, as you say, with us again, the chief Apollo research pilot for the makers. Leo, in this flight for the first time, perhaps the most interesting part to the people on the ground, there will be color television, live transmissions from space. Are there any particular problems involved in that? How is it going to work? Oh, Bill, we don't foresee any problems, and we, do, we are carrying the color television camera for the first time. Right now, we have it mounted permanently in the tunnel area. It can be mounted here permanently, or it can be mounted behind your head looking out your rendezvous window, or it can be mounted behind my head looking out my rendezvous window, or it can be handheld by the crew. Now, another feature... That's right, we hope so. Another feature of this camera is that for the first time, we'll incorporate a monitor in the cockpit for the crew. So the crew will at all times be able to see exactly what they're transmitting back to Earth. As you remember, on Apollo 8, the crew had some difficulty accurately pointing the camera and they had to be coached from the ground. Now, on this flight, they will be able to see exactly what they're transmitting, so we should not have any pointing problems with the camera. You know, another thing about this mission, uh, Leo, is that John Young is going to do so much of the flying, almost all of it, really. There must be a reason for that. Well, Bill, when you're flying two spacecraft, the piloting tasks become very demanding, so the crews have decided to specialize, and John Young has specialized in the command service module. Uh, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan have specialized in the command module. And John, as you say, will be doing most of the command module flying, and I, I believe that... Stafford and Cernan are very happy about this because if anything should happen after they undock in the lunar module around the moon and they have a problem, John Young is going to have to fly the command module solo to rescue him, so they would like him to be just as proficient as humanly possible in flying the command service module. I should think so. You say if anything should happen. Are the risks on this flight greater going closer to the moon? No, Bill, I don't believe the risks are any greater. Uh, we always have certain risks when we're doing a research and development program like this. However, on this particular flight, we, we actually have some backups that we didn't have on previous flights. We have the lunar module with us, so in case of a problem, we could utilize the, the lunar module propul uh, descent propulsion engine uh, as a backup to get out of lunar orbit. So if there are any greater risks, they're also covered by greater backups. A complicated mission, but certainly essential, Walter, if we're to get a man on the moon in July. Bill and Leo, the countdown is now 51 minutes to launch. What are the uh, men up there doing right now? They've been uh, locked into the command module for about an hour and uh, 10 minutes now. Uh, what have they been doing all that time, and what's going on right now up there? Well, Walter, prior to the uh, prime crew ingressing the command module, the backup crew were in the vehicle, and they went through all the switches in the, in the cockpit and all the valves, and they have them all set uh, for launch. Now... When the prime crew ingresses, their first procedure is to enter the command module, get into their couches, get strapped in, get comfortable. Then they run over an additional checklist of the, of the real critical switches to make sure everything is ready. And uh, about this time, the swing arm is being pulled back uh, that allows them to egress the command module. So they're probably in a condition right now where they're ready, if anything should happen, to do a pad abort uh, with the launch escape tower. Uh, 
pad abort with a launch escape tower means the launch escape tower pulls the command module free of the uh, Saturn rocket, takes it out uh, to a uh, altitude where they can then make a re-entry, not actually a re-entry, but a landing uh, using the parachute escape system. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Waller. And uh, as soon as the, the walkway is pulled away from the door of the command module, the crew then has the capability of initiating abort and flying their command module to a safe separation dis distance from the pad should anything occur. They've just pulled that walk away, uh, away. Uh, Leo, we've just seen it on our uh, monitors here. There it is. You can see the uh, walkway uh, entrance there on your left and the command module now standing alone over there on the right, alone on top of the uh, Saturn rocket. Let's look at some of the videotape highlights of this morning's earlier activities, how the spacemen got to their uh, command module, where they now sit there at the 320-foot level. This is Tom Stafford at uh, breakfast this morning, and uh, Eugene Cernan, John Young, as they uh, have their uh, breakfast, they were had uh, a, uh, uh, this is Cernan here, they had for breakfast with them George Lowe, the Apollo spacecraft program manager, and uh, some other officials of the program, as well as uh, three or four other astronauts. This is John Young at 35, the youngest member of the, uh, of our, he's 38, Cernan's 35. Here is Cernan. He made that spacewalk on Gemini 9 with uh, Tom Stafford at the controls of the Gemini spacecraft. Tom uh, and his crew are the most experienced ever to go aloft. All three of them have flown before, two of them twice, and uh, Cerna, uh, they have made 60% of the rendezvous that have been made in space. They're undoubtedly the, the best trained, the best uh, 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 prepared crew for a mission as difficult as this one. Incidentally, the backup commander for this flight was Gordon Cooper, who was uh, the only uh, member of the Mercury team who has been an active astronaut all the way through. Alan Shepard, you know, has just come back into the space program and will fly again, come into the active astronaut program. Now here they're suiting up. You see them putting on their, uh, that was putting on the small uh, liner for the helmet with its communications equipment. This is the outside of the building where they live uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center and they leave uh, in the order of uh, their, uh, their command functions, carrying uh, those portable uh, uh, air conditioners. Those suits can be pretty hot. They are uh, thermally uh, sealed, and there's no air getting in them from the outside at all, so they have to carry those little air conditioners or they would wilt in them pretty quickly. Uh, there's a period of time, uh, some 20, five or 30 minutes before they actually climb into the command module and can hook up with its uh, environmental control system and be cooled by the air there. It's a nine mile drive from uh, their location over on Merritt Island up uh, to the pad itself. They arrive there, as you see here, and then uh, take two elevators, one elevator up to a couple of floors up to where the principal elevator then takes them up to that 320-foot level. This their last contact with uh, the good Earth for eight days. And uh, in their case, because they're going up here at this hour, it was about an hour and a half ago, it'll be another eight days and one and a half hours before they come back. Now across the little walkway at the 320-foot level to the white room, the cabin that clamps around the command module permits the suit uh, and uh, cabin technicians to work and prepare the spacecraft for the launch. The three seats are abreast in the command module and uh, the center seat is uh, tilted forward even as in your uh, five passenger two door car. So that uh, first of all, Stafford who sits in the left hand seat can get in and then Cernan in the right hand seat Then they put the seat back and Young can get into the center seat. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. 